Okay, welcome to Who's Nesting in My Yard. Uh, Barb Whipke is our presenter and she is joining us from her store in Lexington, Mar Lexington Park, Maryland. She owns the Wild Birds Unlimited store there. So she's gracious enough to do these programs for us. Um, we ask that everyone who has joined, you can keep your video on, your video screen, but we ask that you mute yourselves so that your uh, voices or background doesn't interfere with Barb's presentation. And how we've handled these presentations in the past, we, um, Barb gives her presentation tonight, she's gonna have a PowerPoint with her. And as she's, talking, you can go ahead and write any questions that you may have in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through the questions and Barb will answer them. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Barb. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, normally, I prefer to do these without a PowerPoint, but this one I think is just going to be a little bit easier so that I can show you some of the nests and the eggs and what you're looking for. Um, after you're done watching this, you're gonna probably wanna spend some time tomorrow. Hopefully it's gonna be another nice day and just kind of wander your yard and see what kind of nests you may find out there. Still a little early for a lot of nests, but if you keep watching over the next few weeks, you're going to see those numbers grow. I do have in my yard, I saw a Carolina wren nest that's about done and a bluebird nest that she's just, the only thing she has left to do is put the little feathers and soft grass in the center. So it's definitely not too early to start doing your nest searching. And so we're gonna go through that a little bit. So bear with me because I don't usually do the PowerPoint, so. Yeah, Joan, you may have to yell at me if I forget to take it off share screen at some point. Okay. Okay, so can you see the screen there? That looks great. We can okay. see the screen and you're up in the right hand corner. So I awesome. think you're Okay, so we're gonna talk about some of the common backyard nesting birds that you're going to see. There's no way we can cover all of them. So what we're gonna focus on is the most common ones. Uh, but when you're looking for nests, make sure you look down, look up, low, high, everywhere, because, you know, you may have a kill deer and they put their nest right on the ground. Crows and hawks are going to be up higher. Cavities of trees are going to be full. So um, just take a little treasure hunt and go out there and look and see what's there. Okay. Let's back up one. So the basic necessities you need in your yard is food, water, cover, shelter, and a place to raise the young. Food, obviously natural foods work. We'll also talk about a few foods that are exceptionally well to help the birds through nesting season. Cover, leaving some brush piles around. Um, it's a good excuse not to clean your yards. There's tree branches and that that came down during the ice storm and that. Find a corner of the yard that you can leave them. That'll provide cover, shelter, uh, places to raise the young. We obviously think of nesting boxes as the obvious one, but there's so many more places out there. Uh, you know, those lights outside your door will very likely have a nest in them. The ledges around your house, up on top of your gutters, any shrubs, trees. Um, if you have trees that did come down, partially come down during that storm, and you can safely leave the remaining portion, the woodpeckers and some of the other birds will use that for nesting in. Uh, just keep an eye and when it rots out too much, you're going to want to take it down. But as long as it's safe and not going to damage your house or fall on anyone or a car, those are great things to leave. So talking about food, um, high protein food, high protein and calcium is really what the nesting birds need right now. The protein is going to help the young. The calcium is going to make stronger eggshells. Birds' feathers contain over 90% protein in them. So they need those high sources of protein out there. A couple ways 
obviously the natural foods, but supplementing them is a great way to keep the birds in your yard, keep them coming to your feeder. The nesting blend that I show there is chock full of the, it's a nesting super blend, lots of protein, lots of calcium in that. So that's a good one to use. Dried mealworms and live mealworms are great. Especially the live mealworms when they're nesting is a really good one. But we do also have the dry. Right now the birds are totally cool with the dry. As live insects and bugs become more plentiful, you'll see them kind of back off those some um, because obviously the live mealworms or the live insects are definitely have a higher nutritional value. Any of you who have shopped in the store, our bark butter bits are another good one. We have added calcium to these as well. They're naturally high in protein, but then we've uh, put an additional calcium in there to help the birds out. And then baby birds get all of their moisture from food. So, you know, mom can't go get a cup of water or a baby bottle and bring it to them. So they need to find foods that have moisture in them. Suet is a great way to do that. You'll see the birds coming and just grabbing beaks full of suet and taking it off. That's a good sign that they are feeding young somewhere. A lot of times they're going to come, they're gonna eat from it, and then you'll see them take off with a mouthful. Obviously they're feeding young somewhere. Uh, the super suet is the recommended. It also has dried mealworms in it, but it's the highest fat, highest protein on the market. As we go into the heat of the summer, if you've ever fed suet in the summer, you've probably seen it just melt away. You, you may not even notice it, but in our stores, once it st is staying at a regular warm temperature, we'll be swapping these out. It'll still be super suet, but it'll be a no melt version. So you're not going to have to worry about that. What we have there is going to stand up to the heat. The no melt has uh, cornmeal added to it. So it's not as moist. It's not as attractive to the birds as the regular suet. So I do recommend staying with the regular as long as you can. Um, if you stock up on it and you start noticing what you have is dripping away, Stick the rest of that in the freezer and stop back by the store and get you some of the no melt. You'll know if it's too warm. It's pretty obvious. So then water, obviously for drinking, but also for healthy feathers. Birds need to be able to bathe. Those feathers protect them in the wintertime. They fluff up, form pockets of insulation. But in the summer, we don't want the birds getting a sunburn, so they need to have healthy feathers. So making sure you have a steady water source. As it comes nesting season, the birds are looking out for those things like, ah, there's always food here. You know, if you've got a yard where you've sprayed it with chemicals and you don't have a lot of insects there, they're probably going to be bop over to your neighbors where they, their grass may not look as lush and pretty, but there's more, a more reliable food source there. And then if you're keeping those feeders full, if you're keeping those bird baths full, that's a good recipe to keep them nesting in your yard. So some of the most common types of nests. The first is the cup nest up there, which is the traditional nest that we're all familiar with. Uh, there's also a platform nest down there on the bottom. And that in that particular one, we have a robin in there. Uh, there's a lot of different birds that will use platforms. Those are those same ones that you're going to find building, you know, where the downspout comes down and you've got a flat surface building in there um, on the tops of your porch light. Um, that's another one you're going to see. Uh, prim primary cavity nesters, that would be ones like our woodpeckers, meaning that they dig out that hole, they excavate it themselves to use as a place to nest. And then down in the bottom, everybody loves the bluebirds. That's a secondary cavity nester, meaning that they're relying on an abandoned woodpecker hole or the houses that we provide. They are not able to excavate a nest. 
So if you can offer places like this, a cup is going to be, you know, in a tree, shrub. So if you've got some natural plantings in your yard, you've got the perfect scenario for a cup nest. Platform, um, you can add platforms. Um, you'll catch them too up under, if you've got a front porch, a lot of times you're going to keep seeing these Carolina wrens going in and out of there because they're nesting up in there. So that's another good spot. And then secondary cavity nesters, those are going to be the ones that it's very helpful to put the nests up for. And then the primary cavity nesters are by leaving those shrubs and things, or I'm sorry, those snags of trees that they can excavate. So as we, we've kind of covered that already, but the dead, dead snags, um, this is actually a male bluebird there. That one is in my backyard. I put that nest box up and within 30 minutes he was there checking it out. It doesn't always happen that way. That was probably my first year to finally get bluebirds. My yard is not set up for your typical bluebird habitat. It's very heavily treed, not a lot of clear open space. Knock on wood, since that year I have been able to keep them every year, usually just one pair, uh, but I do keep them. In fact, this year's pair have already built that nest, so we should start to see eggs here within the next week or so. And as I mentioned that, if you do notice with those bluebirds, they build the nest. Sometimes then all of a sudden they disappear and you don't see them for a few days. They're off on their honeymoon. Don't worry, they will be back. So just keep an eye out there. So those secondary cavity nesters, like I mentioned, bluebirds, house wrens, tough to tip mice. Those are all gonna be our secondary cavity nesters. Cavity nesting birds are going to use a lot of nest boxes, but they're gonna be particular. They don't want a nest box that has a great big hole in it because they know predators can get in there easily. So they're going to pick and choose and one they need to be able to get into it, obviously, but they're also looking for one that's big enough for them but not big enough for a lot of other birds. So offering you know, a good variety of houses. I always say, if we have a customer that walks in the store and says, I just want a nesting box. I don't really care what time, what kind. We always go for the bluebird box. The reason being in this area, our most common cavity nesters are the bluebirds, the Carolina chickadee, the tufted tit mice, and the Carolina wren. So if they're not particular, putting that house up is going to be a really good likelihood that they're going to get somebody nesting in that one. And those are all four really cool birds that everybody likes having around. And then bushes and trees are very important for those cup nesters. So, and when we say bushes and trees, it doesn't need to be great big ones. Um, you know, just small three to four feet bushes will provide housing for a lot of different birds. So, you know, in those uh, garden area, that would be my husband over there rearranging the pole system. <laughs> uh, but the those small bushes are just fine that you're using in your landscaping to offer housing. So nesting boxes, there's three basic types of nesting boxes. Those cute little ones that you see at the big box store, Dollar General, any of those places, they are as cute as can be. And if you want to hang them up, that's wonderful. But please plug that hole so nobody can nest in that. It does not offer any insulation. Um, that particular one you're seeing there in the top, see that little perch on there? We don't recommend perches on bluebird houses that gives those predators a place to get onto and reach in there and snag an egg or snag a baby. So if you have one that has a perch, we recommend cutting that off. But again, the wood needs to be a thicker wood. So it provides insulation. You know, my, like I said, my bluebirds that are nesting, it's going to get pretty cold in there with them going ahead and getting started this early. So having a thicker wood is going to give them some insulation. This one down here in the bottom is what we call a functional decorative. So it is cute, but it's functional because it has a spot to open it up to clean. 
this particular style we carry in the store um, several different models of them but they're made out of actually made out of recycled houses and barns out of Illinois but it has a plastic white plug in the back that you pop out so that you can get in there and clean afterwards you don't have the advantage of looking in them like you do the more traditional basic functional houses so you won't be able to watch them as closely but if you're looking for pretty that still serves the purpose you can clean it after so they can nest a second time those bluebirds do nest three times while they're here um, or throughout the summer spring and summer but you want to be able to clean it out between every nesting so first one on our list is the northern cardinal a northern cardinal nests in just basically a fork of small branches they don't nest very high off the ground, one to 15 feet high, so pretty low. Um, it is hidden, so they do look for some dense bushes. Unfortunately, not in the best location, so quite often the snakes do find their way to them. They are a bird that if you find the nest, I'm going to suggest that you kind of stay away from it after that. Don't make it real clear that you have found that nest. The other thing, if you go walking over and you check and you find that nest, keep walking and take a different route around because we don't want to leave a trail that shows a raccoon or even a snake to follow that scent right up there. So you walk up there, you look at the bush, you stop, oh cute, you turn, you walk the same path back away. The raccoon or the snake knows the trail ends there. So when he gets to that spot, he's going up trying to follow your scent, looking and will find that nest. So that goes for any of your nesting boxes. When you're checking them, I recommend checking mid morning or early afternoon. So you give more time for that scent to dissipate before the raccoons come out in the evening, they're nocturnal. And when you do check them, you know, kind of take your little trail around, but then keep going past that nest box. Don't walk out of the house, check it and go straight back in the house. You don't want to leave him a trail to follow. I tend to go and walk out there and then I walk down toward the edge of the woods. So I hopefully send them back into the woods and away from my houses. And then that shows you there what the eggs look like. They're just kind of a little spotted, kind of almost pink looking. So one of the behaviors you're going to see right now, I saw this today with my cardinals, it looks like they're kissing. They are not. Uh, the most important job for birds is to eat and to breathe. So what the male is the red for those who may not know and the female is the lighter one. So when he brings some food to her, that's like the best offering he can give her like, hey, look, I can provide for me and you too. And so she's like, oh, okay, yeah, he can provide for me, this is good. So you're gonna start seeing that at your feeders, not with car just cardinals, but with some of the others. So they're actually not kissing, uh, but it is a, a, a courting ritual that you're seeing there. Typically, the cardinal will lay two to five eggs and they'll have one to two broods per year. So after they nest, they will hopefully nest again. Uh, and they kind of need to because unfortunately with the locations where they choose, they often, those young or the eggs often do become a meal for snake. One of the reasons I ask you with cardinals to kind of pretend you didn't really see those is cardinals are a little flighty with their nesting and if they think they've been spotted, they very possibly may abandon their nest. So if you do find those, just kind of try to look inconspicuously and don't make it real obvious that you have found those ones. Um, once they lay those eggs, as with all of these songbirds we're gonna be talking about, they lay a full clutch and then they start setting. So they do not set until they have laid however many eggs they're going to. That means they start setting, about 11 to 13 days you should see those eggs hatch and then they'll fledge 10 to 13 days. If they, when they leave, you can leave that nest alone. Um, if it's not in one of your nest boxes, those you don't need to do anything with, just 
leave it alone. Somebody very well may pick it apart to use another nest. And then the male, once those new ones have hatched, the male will focus on feeding the young while the female goes ahead and gets started on that next nest. And just a little fun fact, most few of the female birds sing, but the Northern Cardinal is one of the females that does sing. And unfortunately, she does it a lot while sitting on a nest. So she's just kind of like, hey, predators, here I am. You know, I didn't pick a great location and look at me. So yeah, sadly, don't get too attached to those nests because they often will. We hear lots of sad stories about those ones. And there's, there's just really nothing you can do to protect. You know, we can protect when we have it in a nest box. Other than that, it's nature being nature. So we just have to suck it up and let it happen. And then the morning dove, where do they nest? Anywhere they want to. If you walk out and one morning on your porch rail, you see an egg, yep, that was very likely a dove or a dead planter scenting out there. Um, those little heads, there's not a lot going on in there. They just kind of put those eggs wherever they want. Uh, so often those, they do not have successful nests. And so they typically lay just two eggs, um, just two little white eggs, but they nest up to five times a year. Obviously they need to keep nesting with their choices of nesting spots and not being very successful. And then the fact that they have such small nests, but they will pick some silly locations. Nest abandonment is very common with morning doves where with the cardinals, I said, pretend not to see them. It doesn't matter. Morning doves just sometimes abandon their nests. So if you see that happen, don't feel that you look too much or it was something you did. Um, they're just kind of here today, gone tomorrow type, like, oh yeah, let's just go on over here. The male takes the day shift with morning doves and the female takes the night shift. And then the Carolina chickadee. A lot of people think what we have here is the black cap chickadee, but actually in this part of Maryland, if you get on up into Western Maryland, up in the mountains, uh, there you're, you're gonna find more likely the black cap. But ours here, you can pretty much be assured that what you're seeing is a Carolina chickadee. So on the chickadees, they can excavate a nest, so they'll find maybe the start of a hole and they can work on pulling that stuff out. And it's amazing to watch those little buggers, how hard they work. And you think they're gonna be at that forever. Uh, but they'll take uh, an abandoned woodpecker hole and maybe make it a little larger. They tend to nest anywhere from two to 25 feet high. They are fun little birds, so if you put a bluebird nest up and immediately you have bluebirds up, I would recommend adding another one because those chickadees or even those tufted tip mice are fun little birds to have there too. And they will use that same nest box. So you've got a nest, you pop it open and you see moss at the bottom. That's going to be either a Carolina chickadee or a tufted tip mice. And I'll show you a minute the tufted tip mice. So take a good look at that one. It's mostly moss with a light at the top. There's a light covering of some, some maybe fur, feathers, whatever, grasses. You may see them working and you go out and you pop, nope, still no eggs, they've been in and out, what's going on? Quite often when she leaves the nest, she will smooth a layer of that soft stuff, soft stuff over top until she actually starts nesting. So she'll pop in there, lay her egg, cover it, come back the next day. So you might have to, if you really wanna see if there's a nest, you may have to just kind of poke a little finger down in there gently and see if you feel something on that because they do a good job covering when, that, when they leave. But theirs is mostly going to be moss on their nest. And so they, oops, let me back up here. They lay one, do one nest a season, that's it. They do one and they're done. 
And incubation is 12 to 15 days. Again, they're not gonna start setting until they have laid that full nest there. Then they're gonna set on them. The babies will fledge about six to 19. So see this cute little picture, how they're all butts in and heads out. It is very common if you open the top of your nest box and snap a picture to see them that way. Not always, but it's quite often that they'll be in this just perfect little circle. It's so cute. A quick comment on this as far, oh, and real quick though, let me show you up there, the eggs, I'll point that out there. So where the Cardinals was a little pinker, this is gonna be a little whiter, but still have those little spots on that. Nesting material, we talked about nesting boxes, but nesting material. Dryer lint, how many of you have heard dryer lint? Put your dryer lint out there and you save that dryer lint all year long. Please don't put your dryer lint out there. There is not enough insulation factor in dryer lint to really protect them. We're also using chemicals, laundry detergent, fabric softeners, things like that on our, in our laundry. So please don't pop those in there. Then we would say, oh, your pet fur, put your pet fur out there, put some yarn out there. Cornell's most recent is don't put pet hair. We're using chemicals there. Again, you still don't have that absorbency, but it's don't be surprised if you do see pet hair, horse hair, something like that in there. I mean, they will still find it, but don't intentionally pop it out there for them. We have, real quick, some different nesting material that you can use. Um, this one is alpaca hair that is safe to use. It does protect the alpacas out there. So it will do the same to them where with our pet hair, they're more inside pets, hopefully. Uh, yarn, one of the, I, for years I did yarn, cut it in these little tiny pieces. One year, probably four, five, six years ago, mom and dad are calling, calling, calling for this chickadee to come out and everybody's left the nest and they're calling and he's not coming. And so I said to my husband, something's wrong. So I opened the nest box and when I did, this little chickadee just keeps doing this, trying to get up, but couldn't. So I reached in there, grabbed him. He had a little piece of yellow yarn, just the little threads, not even the whole yarn wrapped around his toenail. So he basically was stuck in the nest. So unwound that from his little nail, popped him back in there, closed it, and immediately he fledged out to mom and dad. So I'm not going to say you're not going to find those things in the nest box, but please don't use them. Natural's best. We've got some different little feeders, balls, things like that that you can use for food, but you can also use them for nesting material. Anybody that has the peanut wreath that we sell, that's one good one. And just go out. This is a great thing to do with kids. Go out and find some natural nesting period, uh, nesting material. Grab some of that moss, some pine straw, some dry grasses and leaves. Fill it full, then hang it out there and see who comes and takes that material. Um, again, take a little tray some dirt in there, some water, make some mud, sit it out there and watch. You're gonna see birds just come and take mouthful of mud that they're gonna use to paste their nest together. So that's just kind of an extra fun way that you can. Uh, so the female builds of the nest on them, 16 to 19 days is fledging. And then the tufted tip mice, cool little birds, um, just a lot of personality. But as you notice on that nest, remember I asked you to take a close look at the Carolina chickadee. This one has moss in it too, but the tufted tit mice works a lot more leaves and dried grasses and things into there. So that bottom layer, you may not at first be able to tell whether it's a tufted tit mice or a Carolina chickadee, but as that nest continues to build, you'll be able to pretty quickly tell that, okay, they're, they're putting some leaves and dried grass and where the chickadee is just gonna be all moss with the layer of soft material. 
So tit mice are also cavity nesters, but whereas the Carolina chickadee can excavate a nest, the tufted tit mice cannot. So they're counting on those abandoned woodpecker holes or the nest boxes that you're going to put up. Their eggs, very similar to the Carolina chickadee, but as you can see, there's a lot more spots and they have more of that pinkish look. You're gonna easily be able to tell a cardinal from the tufted titmouse egg because the tufted titmouse is going to be in a cavity, the cardinal is going to be in a bush or a shrub. So uh, they also do just one brood a year. Commonly, uh, most common clutch side is five to six, but it is not unusual for them have to have up to three to nine. During in incubation, the male will feed the female both on and off the nest. So if you see her come to the feeder, you're going to see him feed. Typically, it's a, you're not able to tell the difference between the male and female, but during nesting season, you will because you'll catch him feeding her. Another cool thing is quite often the tufted tit mice, the kids from the last year's nesting will help with this year. Tough to tip mice never have the opportunity to be empty nesters because their young stay with them for an entire year. But on a good note, they do kind of help to raise those young the next year a lot of times. And then the house finch. So if you come in and tell us there's something nesting on the wreath in my door, our first guess is going to be the house finch. They love, love, love to nest on your wreath. So if you put that Christmas wreath up and you didn't get it down soon enough, it may already be too late. Um, we've already started having calls of people that have nests being built. If there's no eggs in it, you can try to relocate it maybe over onto the wall near the door. But they do love the, the wreaths. Carolina wrens will also nest in a wreath but it is more common that it's the house finches. In this case, the female's the one on the right, the male is the one on the red. She needs to be a little more inconspicuous, so we don't want her to have any bright colors. They tend to nest 10 to, five, 10 to 15 feet high, and they nest everywhere. Like I said, the reeds, uh, they will nest on porches on your lamp post over your door, buildings, I mean, they will nest just about anywhere. Uh, they are messy ones, so if they are nesting on your door, it will get kind of messy. So I do recommend if you have that wreath that you absolutely love, get out there tomorrow and check it to see, make sure there's nothing in it, and if not, get that down before it's too late. And then their clutch side is two to six but they will raise one to six broods a year. So again, if you don't want them nesting there on the porch, uh, you better fix it now. They're going to have two to six in a clutch and then they're gonna sit on those eggs for 13 to 14 days. It's going to be easy to tell whether it's Carolina wrens or house finches if you come in and tell us that they're nesting on your porch. The, the house finch is going to be blue eggs, and I'll show you the wren in a, in a moment, but it's definitely easier to tell. They're more of the pinkish color. So it'll be blue, uh, a pale blue, and it'll have just a few speckles on it. Uh, they, house finches feed their nestlings exclusively plant foods. Our goldfinches do the same thing. A lot of our birds that are veg vegetarians will feed animal products to the young just to get that protein in them. But the house finches and goldfinches, they do stay strictly vegetarian throughout nesting season. Um, if you do have these house finches or Carolina wrens nesting on your front porch, a really cool thing to do is put a window feeder on that front window there and they, they'll come, you'll see them come straight to the window feeder and then back to the nest. So that gives you an opportunity to really see the whole thing take place. 
uh, one day I had a Carolina Wren and they kept grabbing the dried mealworms and going to the driveway and then back up to the, I have, I put a hanging basket up every year early on and a Carolina Wren nests in it. So she has me well trained, uh, but she kept going, grabbing those mealworms to the, so I finally got up and went to watch. She was taking that dry mealworm, dipping it into a little puddle and then bringing it up to feed the young to get the moisture into them. So the birds are just amazing. Okay, what do these things have in common? Let's see who can figure this one out. Any guesses out there? Type it in if you have a clue what bird this might be. Anybody? That's going to be the Carolina Wren. They will nest in anything. If you leave your jacket hang there on that porch chair too long, you may have a pocket full of wrens. That boots, when you kick them off, uh, the propane tanks, planters, anywhere. They really like to nest near our homes. So they're looking for anything, grill covers, any of that kind of stuff. We get calls every year where they have nested in campers and boats and the back of the tires on Jeeps that hasn't moved much. So keep an eye on those areas because once they've nested and those eggs are in there, that's protected. So you can't destroy them. So if you see them starting to build, you want to stop it from happening before they get too far and get the eggs in there. So Carolina wrens, if you're not familiar what they are, they are those cute little brown birds with the little tail that sticks up in the air. They're the first one that wakes you up in the morning singing that loud, loud song and you're expecting a big bird when you look out there. And instead it's just this little tiny thing with a great big voice. They prefer to nest three to six feet off the ground, but like I said, they really don't care. They will nest anywhere there's a spot and especially if it's close to your home. They will nest uh, one to three times a year. They do a cool little thing where they will go around and build fake nests. So they're like, oh, here's a potential site and here's one and here's one. And dad will start to build a nest in all of those so that nobody moves in on top of him. So he's got it protected. Then he goes along, finishes the one he thinks best. Mom comes and checks it out. She decides she likes it, she puts a porch on it. So if you've ever looked at a Carolina wren nest, it has kind of a cover and the opening is on the side of it. So she'll finish that off if she approves of it. So once they've started nesting and you have these other sites where somebody's kind of just put a little bit of grass, a little bit of pine straw in there, and you're like, okay, these are nesting here and nothing has changed with this one over here for three weeks or so, you can go ahead and pull that out so that somebody potentially can use that spot. You're feeding them, so there's gonna be plenty of food. They just didn't quite think there was going to be, so they wanted to make sure it was covered. And then there it shows you just a good example. Uh, like I said, in boots, uh, the, they again will also build up on top of that light by your door which can be a problem because then they you open the door to go in and whoop, they pop right in the door with you. Grills, so watch your barbecue grills. If you catch them in there, you wanna stop that, pop it open or something for a few days. But again, you gotta do it before those eggs because it is protected then at that point. But their nest is gonna be really obvious because that opening is in the side. And then the Eastern Bluebird. The male finds the nest, but the female will decide whether she accepts it. So he's gonna choose a nest. He's going to watch it for usually a couple weeks and you'll see him just sitting over it, popping in a few times a day, looking at it, going on his way. And then one day, it's really cool if you get to see it because it kind of plays out the same way. He'll bring her to the nest site, She'll go inside. He's going to be on top, leaning down, just chattering away to her. She's in there for quite a while. 
to decide whether that's the one they want. Um, this year when I saw them do it, they checked that one. Then he took her to the other one that he had been watching. She came back to the first one and then ultimately she chose the first one. At that point, often they will put a rent deposit down, which is usually just a blade of grass or a piece of pine straw. Most commonly, I see the pine straw around this area. And that's the rent deposit. So if you see that, now it's time to get excited because at some point they are probably going to build in there. That can take a couple weeks, several weeks even before they ever do anything. And then all of a sudden somebody flips the switch and that morning when she gets up, she is crazy just building that nest. They build a really pretty nest as you can see. Um, that one has some moss in it. My guess is that person did not clean the nest out very well after a chickadee or titmice because typically it's just going to be pine straw and dried grasses. They weave a really pretty nest. You'll know when that nest is almost done, it will fill up most of the cavity. But then in the bottom, they'll tend to put some soft grass. Um, sometimes they'll put a few feathers in there for a lining. And then all of a sudden they disappear. And that's where you're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Something's happened. Maybe they're not gonna use it. Should I tear the nest out? No, 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 leave it alone. They're on the honeymoon. They will be back. And all of a sudden, like clockwork, she comes back, you go check, there's an egg in there. You're gonna check that nest. At least in the beginning when they're laying, I would say every three days or so, because you wanna get a good count of when they finally start setting. So you're in there, there's oh, three eggs, next day four, five, next day it's still five. That's going to be day one of incubation. So you, she does not start setting like those other songbirds we mentioned until she's laid that full clutch. And then she's gonna set on that nest 12, 14, 15 days, something like that. Once the birds are really well feathered, you're gonna stop checking because we don't wanna encourage them to fledge early. And the same goes for all of those other ones too. When you're noticing that those birds are very well feathered, it's time just to back off and wait and watch. We don't wanna, if we scare them and they fledge early, you can pop them back in the hole, you can pop them back in the nest. By the time you turn around, they're out again. Once they have learned the way out, you're not keeping them in there. So once, once they're well feathered, they've learned to fear you, just kind of back off and watch from a distance. And again, that goes with all of those birds. Bluebirds in this area, we typically see them nesting three times a year. Once those babies have left the nest, immediately clean out that nest box. Same thing, whether it's any of the birds that nest in your nest box, once they have fledged, clean it out. That's going to allow another bird to come in there and nest. Once the babies have gone out, they will not go back in. You may see the parents pop back in and look around. Uh, they may be shopping, thinking about using it again, reminiscing, I'm not quite sure what they're doing, but those babies aren't coming back in and there's no need for that nest in there. And in fact, we want them to build a new nest. If you don't clean it out and they decide that's where they're going to nest again, they'll build a second nest on top of that. Now that second nest is going to be way too close to the hole and you run the risk of babies falling out of the nest. You've been watching the nest, so you've been seeing mom and dad in and out and just, you know, Grand Central Station, it's busy there. And all of a sudden that morning, there's like eerie silence. That's your key that they left the nest box. So you can pop over there, just kind of put your hand over the hole, pop it open to confirm they're gone and then go ahead and clean that out so that somebody else can use it. And if you do have, you know, we talked about the chickadee and titmice only nest once a year. So if you put that bluebird house up and you were ready for the bluebirds and a chickadee took it over, you can do one of two things. You can add another nest box for the bluebirds or you have a good chance since this, the bluebirds will nest two or three times that once you clean that out, they will use it the next time. So don't get totally discouraged if you're not able to put up another nest box. 
And then the lazy cowbird. So the cowbird is a parasitic bird, meaning they don't build their own nest. They will just pop into somebody else's nest and lay that egg there. They let the other bird raise the young up. One of the problems is with that cowbird is that it's a larger egg than a lot of the, the nests they're laying them in. So that baby hatches sooner. By the time in this particular case, uh, we've got a house finch nest there. So that cowbird is going to have already hatched. Eyes will be open before those other babies hatch. So when mom's bringing in food for her young, that cowbird scooping up a lot of that food. So there ends up not being a good rate of survival for the, the house finches or the wrens, bluebirds, whoever it is. But the cowbird is protected, so you cannot do anything. And there have been cases where people have gone and tossed the cowbird egg out. The cowbirds came back to look in on her kids and has damaged those other eggs. So all you can do is be frustrated and just let it happen. Um, again, it's nature. May not always be the way we want it to turn out, but it is nature and we just kind of have to go with it sometimes. Um, on a good note, because they have developed faster, sometimes they, usually they will fledge sooner than the other birds. So the hope is that then she can get the, any of them that are surviving fueled up before they fledge. But yeah, cowbirds are just cowbirds. You just got to go with it. So as we go into the ends of nesting season, as birds are starting to fledge, please don't show up here and bring us a bird. Uh, it happens multiple times every year. Basically, the majority of the time, those birds have been bird napped from their mother. When baby birds leave the nest, they are not able to fly yet. So they're going to be hopping around on the ground. If you see that happening, as long as it's safe, there's no cats around that area, just back up out of sight. And you'll usually see the parents coming, feeding the young, calling them up into the tree, and they just go on. If you are in a situation where you've got a cat that's around there, then yeah, definitely pick it up. Try to put it up in a branch making sure that mom and dad see what you're doing there. Uh, but other than that, just kind of leave, watch from a distance, uh, but you've got to give space. If you're standing right there, like literally watching, the parents aren't going to come and feed. So you need to pop in the house or, you know, out of sight and watch from a distance. Usually within 30 minutes, you'll see the mom is right there. And these, you're, it's pretty easy to recognize fledglings. They are about the same size as the adult bird when they leave the nest, but they have no tail. They'll just kind of be bebopping around. Their tails, their feathers are not fully grown in and the tail seems to be the last one to come. So they are just popping around there, but you'll catch the parents, come and feed them. And just let them go, it will happen. If you go out there and you find a baby bird that's alive and is, you know, not feathered, you know, is obvious it's out of the nest too soon, the best thing you can do is take like a Cool Whip dish, put some holes in the bottom, a basket with some holes, and tack it up into the tree. If you can find the actual nest, the absolute best thing is to pop it back in the nest. I know our parents told us don't touch them or the mother won't feed them, the mother will kick them out of the nest, you know, whatever. That's not true. Pop them up back in the same nest if you can find it. If not, create a makeshift nest nearby, put a little bit of grass or something in it, and just tack it to the tree nearby, and then keep a watch from a distance, an hour or so, and you'll probably see the parents come back. The parents cannot grab that baby up and carry it back to the nest, so they'll need to continue caring for it from there. If still nobody has come, then you're gonna to want to go on the Department of Natural Resources for Maryland, look for a licensed wildlife rehabber. Whatever you do, do not feed or water that bird. 
it's very easy to aspirate them. You know that everybody wants to take an eyedropper and give them a drop of water. It's better to give them nothing, get it to a licensed wildlife rehabber. Here in St. Mary's County, you can even call animal control and they will come and get them and get them to a wildlife rehabber. Uh, the best thing is if you can find a wildlife rehabber that will take them, is if you can take them to them yourself, the whole thing's gonna happen quicker that way. But as a last resort, then you can call animal control. Know that all of the wildlife rehabilitators are volunteers, so they're not sitting by their phones or their Facebook waiting for your calls or messages. You are going to have to leave a message. They are very, very busy during baby season. So be patient with them. Um, and it's always a good thing just to, you know, give them a few dollars to help them out. They pay, they get no grant money. They pay for all of that out of their own pockets. When we, we retired from the Marine Corps here in 2003 and moved here, but we lived in uh, the Virginia Beach area before. And I was a wildlife rehabilitator for the state of Maryland. So I, or I'm sorry, for the state of Virginia. I will tell you, it's a lot of sleepless nights, long hours. Uh, it's, it's a very trying thing. Uh, your survival rate is not great. So you mourn with every one of those you lose. You know, you've given hours trying to save them. So just, you know, please show your appreciation to those wildlife rehabilitators and be understanding when they don't get right back to you. But again, here in St. Mary's County, I know you hear bad stuff about animal control, blah, 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 but they truly are good people. They will get them to the, the vet if they need to. They'll get them to a wildlife rehabber. So, you know, use your resources. Uh, it's a good thing beforehand to kind of look up, go to DNR, print out those numbers so you have them handy because it's not just going to be, you know, people that are watching the birds tend to be outside a lot. So you're going to see squirrels and possums and bunnies and all sorts of things that may need help. So it's just good to have those numbers handy before the situation hits. So when you, we talked about the five things, the shelter, the cover, the nesting, water, food, when you do that, you can turn your backyard into an amazing habitat. Um, I know over this last year now, it's hard to believe, we have all probably spent a lot more time in our yards. I know a lot of you are probably new to the hobby during this time. And it's just going, you're going to see that continue to grow because you're, as those babies hatch and fledge, the parents are now going to bring them to your feeders. You're gonna be watching the parents feed the babies and then the new ones. And next year, those babies are all here. So you're just gonna see your population of birds continue to blossom and grow. And it really is amazing. But I really wanna recommend that over these next couple of weeks, take some time if you've got kids or grandkids Get them out and just do a little treasure hunt around your yard. Look and see who's nesting out there. Look up, look down. You know, we talked about very few of them here, but there actually are a lot more birds that you're going to see. Some of them you're not going to see the nesting. Uh, saw a crow the other day carrying uh, some nesting material. So you're gonna see signs of nesting, but you may not actually see the nesting but just keep watching those and it's, it's gonna be amazing to see what you see in your yard. So with that, let me see if I can get this off stop share. And what questions do you have? We have a good list here. I'm gonna go back and start at the beginning just so I don't uh, lose any. Some of these may have, you may have answered these as we've gone along. Um, are there certain common household foods that can be used slash that should be avoided? In general, I would say avoid the household foods. Um, you know, if you want to cut up oranges and put out. Now, oranges are great for our mockingbirds, bluebirds, Carolina wrens, any of our 
fruit eating birds will, but in general, I would just tend to stay away from people food. There, there's more that aren't good than are. Um, find, a, find a bird store or a store and get you some good quality bird seed to offer to them, things that are already formulated for the birds. And that way you're getting all the nutritional things that they need in there. With that said, offering a bigger variety of foods will bring you more birds. Birds choose their food based on the shape of the food and the shape of their bill. So if you're just offering black oil, you'll get a good variety of birds. But when you start adding in suet or, you know, suet nuggets and fruits and uh, grape jelly, things like that, you'll start to see more birds appearing or the mealworms. So I know one thing with the, with, you said the grape jelly, but there, you don't want us to just use jelly out of the grocery store. It has too much sugar in it. Exactly. Yeah. We don't want that high fructose sugar in there. Um, we have a, a jelly here in the store that is much lower. It's not human grade, although I have heard from others that it does taste pretty good. <laughs> it's not as sweet as some jelly, but yeah, I would... There is jelly in the store that would be okay, but I would advise you either to do your do your research and make sure what's in that jelly before you grab it. How about eggshells? Okay, so eggshells are a way to, you. so this is one kind of cool thing. Have you ever been walking around the yard and you see a little piece of an egg laying out there and you're like, how did this happen? Well, when those eggs hatch in the nest box or the nest, the parents will take them out here and drop them to get them out of the nest. Other birds will bebop along and actually eat those eggshells for calcium. So if you're going to use eggshells, so if you've, you know, you're going to use your eggshells from home, you want to crumble them up fine and you want to, uh, you know, do a good fry in the, the skillet, no grease or anything, just to kill any bacteria or anything like that on that that bark butter that I mentioned, or any of our plus seeds, anybody that's using our uh, Tree Nutty Plus or No Mess Plus, those all have calcium added to it. So that's an even easier way to get it in there. So you said if you're gonna put your eggshells in the yard to fry the eggshells? Yeah, you wanna fry them first. So you're gonna basically be heating them up really well to kill any bacteria that may be on there. Okay. And then you can sprinkle them in a tray feeder or a little tray outside, something like that. Okay. That's a, that, I've never heard of that before. So when you put them in the pan, you don't have to put oil or anything else in. You just heat them up high enough. Exactly. To, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, do birds commonly reuse the birdhouses? And you touched upon that, that they will go back, it, but we should clean them out, correct? Right. And then... Um, and the parents don't lay eggs there again, but but some they do. They'll go some back. Do, yeah, some of them will build up. Um, so it just really is better as soon as you see activity slow down there, get it cleaned out. Usually you can just, you know, wipe it out, use a paintbrush or something, brush it out real quick and then get on out of there so that somebody else will claim it. Sometimes with those bluebirds, especially if you only have one bluebird house, you need to get in there and get out quick because if you let it go a couple of days, they will have already started building another one. How about a nest that you see, like right now, none of the trees have leaves on them. And, and once in a while, I'll see a nest from last year. Will, those, will birds reuse those nests? Those Some of them don't... will, and those are perfectly fine to leave. Some birds will reuse a nest. Um, others will take that nest apart and use for nesting material. Okay. So it makes an easy resource for them. If they find that nest and there's good material there, just leave it alone and you'll watch them come and grabbing from there to build their new nest. Okay. So those are best just left alone. Yeah. Um, how early in spring do nests appear? Sounds like the bluebirds come. The bluebirds here. and wrens are already, bluebirds are one of our first nesters of the year. Um, so they are already building. So get those bluebird houses up. If you didn't clean them out over the winter or at the end of last nesting season, you need to get out there and check if it's an old nest, get it cleaned out. You'll be able to tell whether it's an old nest or a new one. The new ones won't be packed as tightly yet. 
uh, but go ahead and get that cleaned out. If not, if you're not absolutely sure it's not a new nest, just be diligent and watch it closely as close as you can for a few days for any activity. If you're not seeing any activity and you're fairly certain that it is an old one, then go ahead and clean that out. Okay. So they'll, they'll start their nests now, but they're not going to really start laying eggs yet. They could start laying within a few days. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Do the birds lay one egg per day until they have their clutch? Then yep. you start counting the incubation after the last egg. Exactly. So when you look that day, there was three. Tomorrow there's four. The next day there's five. The next day there's still five. That's day one of incubation. Okay. Uh, what do you need? The, what do you mean the nest is protected once the eggs are there? It's actually against the law to destroy them. Uh, there's a Migratory Bird Act. So birds are a protected species. The only ones that are not protected are house sparrows, which those are ones you see a lot in parking lots. Those are the ones in Lowe's and Walmart and that. Uh, house sparrows, starlings, which is the dark kind of shiny looking birds, but the smaller ones with the shorter tail. Uh, starlings and then pigeons. And when I say pigeons, I don't mean doves. Doves are protected. But those are our only three species that it would be okay to destroy a nest. So other than that, once those eggs are in there, you have to do your best to protect them. Okay, so if people see their, their wreath have with little sticks and things in them right now, get the wreath down or, and clean double, them out. Yeah. Double check once. that there's no eggs there yet. Honestly, if it was me, I would take that nest and just move it over a little bit, keep it there on the porch. I love having them nest nearby. Okay. Um, but if, or if you're okay, we have plenty of customers that will just not use that door, you know, especially if it's a side door or something, they just won't use it. And then the cool thing is quite often there's a window there. <laughs> I used to have a pet sitting customer and she left me a note when I went in, hey, climb up on the ladder at the front door and look out. So in her front door inside the house, there was a two-step stool. And so you were just looking right down in the nest at the, the little baby. So oh, that's cute. Yeah, especially if you have little ones, even if you don't have little ones, heck, nesting season is just cold. <laughs> okay, uh, what's the next one? I have nest boxes, but they don't seem to be attracting birds to make a nest. What am I doing wrong? Should I be putting nest materials in the boxes? Yeah, nope, you don't want to put them in. So my question would be, and I did, I'm glad you asked that because I did not hit on that. So nests should never be on trees or fences. If you put a tree, a nest box on a tree or fence, a predator can come right up there, a raccoon, a snake, that only has to happen once and that bird is not going to nest in that. She has learned that that's not a good location. Sometimes you don't even realize that happened. You were watching the babies and then, oh, they fledged that quickly. And it actually wasn't a case of that, that the raccoons or snakes found them. So we recommend if you're putting nesting boxes up, you want a baffle like this. It is long enough that your raccoons can't get up and your snakes will go up underneath here. But unless it's a really good climber or an extremely long snake, they're not able to figure out how to bridge around there. So you just pop that on there, mount your house up here at the top. Usually these are very successful. The cool thing with that one is if you put it up and it sits there for a couple of weeks and nobody nests, you're gonna walk in, nobody's touched it. And this top just unscrews and you can just rotate it a different way. And so we'll just tell you to turn it a different way. And there's a good chance that is all it took. Um, you know, maybe it was facing out over a road or a driveway. Well, they know when those babies leave the nest, they've got to get them to safety. So you want that nest facing an open area. So as they're feeding, they can pop, look, make sure there's no hawks there and then fly to safety. But they also want a tree or low bush nearby. So when those babies do leave the nest, they can get them to safety. So if you've got those trees on nest on, I'm sorry, if you've got those nesting box on trees or fences, 
get them up and get them baffled where it's safer. And if you did potentially have something get in that nest box, you can still use the nest box. Just put it in a different location. The, the bird is not gonna associate the box with what happened. It's the location that she's going to associate with. So just try moving it, moving a location. Make sure that your nesting boxes are larger, you know, thicker, they're the correct size holes. Um, you can snap a picture of it or even bring the nesting box in to see us and we'll take a look at it and give you suggestions. I have a couple cutesy ones in my yard that are adorable, but those holes are blocked so that nobody can nest in those because it's not a safe habitat. It's there more for decoration. So just double check that nest box for all of those things. Okay, um, let's see the next one. Can we get an email copy of these slides? There's a lot of good information to have on hand. Yeah, I can forward that to you, John. Okay, so we'll do that. We'll send that out with the email. We'll also, um, the library will also send a link to this video that you'll be able to go back and look at as well. Right. Um, where do I look for a hummingbird nest? Ah, That's a good question. I'm next next month for that one. <laughs> I intentionally did not cover that one. Um, next month, Joan, what's the date? April 6th, we are going to be having um, another program with Barb. It's called All About Hummingbirds. So it'll be April 6th from 6.30 to 7.30. And when I send out the reminder, or I'll send out a follow-up email tomorrow, and that will have the information on how to register for the um, April 6th class. We'll have the link to the um, video. It'll be on the St. Mary's County Library YouTube page. And what else will we have? Oh, we, we'll have a link for the slides as well. Right. And, um, but I will say that I have never, ever, ever seen a hummingbird nest. Um, they're only about the size of a thimble. They are really tough to find. So you're very lucky if you've ever seen one of those. But now is a good time to be looking for those. Look just kind of in a little fork of a tree. But you have to have really good eyes and get really lucky. Would you be able to see one at this time of year? You could before the leaves are out, yes. Okay, so it would be from last year. Be last year's, right, okay. yes. I'm going to do that. I've <laughs> always wanted to see one. Okay, is there a more natural recipe for hummingbirds to put in feeders? I guess we'll cover that again next month too. Yeah, but there sure is. Um, I will throw out real quick uh, because when people say more natural, that always scares me. Please don't use organic sugars. Don't use honey. Don't use brown sugar. Um, you know, we, we have a couple different kinds you can use, but also just good old plain white sugar like your grandmother always had. Um, one part sugar, four parts water, but we will cover all that next month, so. And when you cover it next month, it'll be in plenty of time for oh, yeah. our hummingbirds. Yeah, so um, our hummingbirds here typically show up around the middle of April, so we'll just be gearing up for hummingbird season then. Good, I'm excited about that. Okay, let's see. Where is the best place to put a platform type birdhouse? Do you see them? Yeah, so uh, platforms, let me grab one here. We don't have many of these. Um, the supply chain is killing us, but this is one. You could put it right up next to your, your porch or something. Oh. Again, they're, the ones that are using the platforms quite often are going to be the ones that are totally cool with being right up next to your house. So you can, this one comes with screws. You just kind of screw it up there. And as long as you're okay with it on your porch or, you know, near a door or whatever, just kind of have it, you know, where it's got some shelter. So are those safe? I've never seen one. Are they safe for as far as like a snake or something? Um, no. <laughs> Honestly, no. Um, we cannot protect all of the birds. So... They're just fun to watch. Yeah, exactly. You hope for the best, uh, but those are the same birds that are going to be nesting under your deck, under your porch that are using those. But no, potentially a snake can crawl up right up your porch rail, right up the siding, um, any of those places. So if you're concerned with that, you might put it out further. 
but they do need some kind of shelter on that. So you could potentially, you know, put it on a post with, um, you know, we do have baffles that you can use the same baffle, the same type of setup. Uh, but in that case, I would put it, you know, where it's a little more protected because that one's kind of out in the elements. Okay. That, that was interesting. I would have thought that was a feeder. So I'm glad you showed us that. Yeah, yeah that was a good question. Uh, do you have advice for how to feed birds while gone on vacation? I feel bad if the food runs out. Cylinder feeder, please. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>, so <laughs> this is why he, he comes after work. He comes in with me for these talks so he can be my runner. <laughs> Uh, so we have cylinders that I, I love in general, but they are especially good for vacations. I will say birds only get 10 to 28% of their food from our feeders. So don't stress if you come home from vacation and they're gone. But we have feeders like this and there's several different styles. Um, let me see, that one might show a little better. So one like this, and then we have cylinders that can go on this. So this is solid food with a gelatin in it, holding it together, has a hole in the center. So you would just drop it down on this peg and hang it up. We actually have a larger size that are great for before vacations. That's actually this big around. So it's four and three quarters pounds. So those are great ways to feed for vacation. And you can use those all summer. They're not gonna melt or anything. So they're not going to melt as we get into August and September, early October, where it's disgustingly humid. They will mold with time with the moisture in that. So sometimes during those months, we'll recommend, not sometimes, quite often during those months, we'll recommend dropping to our smaller sizes so that it's only sitting out there for a couple weeks at a time. Um, several of the pet sitting businesses around, if you're using a pet sitter, they will refill bird feeders and those are an easy kind to just get a neighbor, you know, to just ask them, you know, hey, can you in a week go over and just drop this one on or that neighbor kid that wants to make some money. Those are just, you know, instead of messing with the loose seed and this food goes here and here, that's a good way to keep them fed. Okay. I will say I had one of those and on your recommend and the birds weren't coming to it anymore and you recommended if they're not coming to it, check it for mold and then clean it with the Clorox and water. And I did that and I haven't had a problem since. I, I just rinsed it out and didn't realize all the mold wasn't gone. So right. once I did that. Yes, when something molds, it gets mold spores there. So if you just take that one, throw it away, put a new one on there, those mold spores are still there. So it's going to quickly cause your new one to mold. So you wanna use a one to nine bleach solution to kill those mold spores. Soak it in that, wash it well, rinse it well, and then let it dry and refill. Yeah, that, that really helped mine. Okay, um, I have a question. Somebody wants to know where your shop is. It's in Lexington Park, um, and you also have one in, in La Plata. Right, so the Lexington Park one is in the plaza with Kohl's and Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, right next to Sports Clips, just down from Sonic and that. So we're right in here. Um, across from us is what, Jimmy John's and Mathnasium and that, but we're in that plaza. The La Plata one is in the corner right between Target and Famous Footwear. And I can put uh, both addresses in the follow-up email tomorrow as well, so that if people want to Google it for um, direction's sake, yeah. we can have that. Okay, um, here's the last question. Do birdhouses need to be a certain distance apart? Yes, so if you're looking to attract bluebirds, you want about 150 yards between them. A lot of us don't have 150 yards and we also don't really care if it's just bluebirds that nest in there. I have bluebird, I have houses, bluebird houses set very close together only one of them is going to have bluebirds in it. They are not going to let any bluebirds nest in those other ones. They don't care about chickadees. They don't care about tufted titmice or Carolina wrens. The reason being is they're only concerned with the species that primarily eats the same food as those. So with the bluebirds, their primary food 
is insects that they're catching off the ground. You could actually put a bluebird house on the front, a tree swallow on the back, and they would share. They would be totally cool with that because the tree swallows are catching their bugs in the air. They're catching the flying ones. So they are so stinking smart that they know who's competition for the food chain there. So they're totally cool with that. But you have lots of bluebirds and you want another one, but you don't quite have that 150 yards. Then what we'll recommend is one in the backyard, one around the side or the front. Try to get some space so they're out of sight of each other and that will often let them work. At my house, again, my yard is not designed for bluebirds. We are very heavily treed back in the woods. So we're always just very fortunate that we have one pair every year. I would be shocked if I ever had two pairs in a year, even though I do have enough space that I could space them out. It's just not a good, the open environment, it's too wooded for them to get the easy meals of the insects there hopping through the grass. So Barbara, I have two, two things to say. I, you and I were talking, a lot of people from your programs have gotten excited about the bluebirds. And, and you mentioned that even if you have the proper food and the house, it could take a couple of years. So don't give up hope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, about, I wanna say it was like six years ago, some of you, well, remember we had that crazy March snow that was so out of character. During the winter months, bluebirds live communally in a bluebird house. I had seven in mine this winter living together. So starting late February, they pair off and everybody else gets kicked to the curb. We got that crazy cold snap and a lot of people went out to find a pair of bluebirds frozen to death in their houses. So that really depleted the the bluebird population, not depleted it, but you know, really created havoc with it. It takes about three years to recover from something like that. So we are now about five to six years out and the bluebird population is just crazy. Every day we have customers saying, I've never had a bluebird before. So now's the time to get those bluebirds. Our numbers are up really high right now. Then next year, as you go in the, to the winter, what we're gonna encourage you to do is keep that food going, keep that house up and have a steady water source. Heated bird bath, head a heater to your bird bath or make sure you're going out a couple of times a day and keeping fresh water. Bluebirds are water loving birds. So you wanna have that water there for them. If you have those things, so they've all been hanging out there in the winter because you've got all that, you've got that house. And so then it comes time for them to move off to nesting there's a good chance, which is exactly how it happened for me, this pair was like, hey, why go? We'll just stay here. In fact, last year, we had that, uh, I want to say typhoon, we spent a few years in Japan, hurricane, uh, hurricane, and I lost my pair of bluebirds. They had young at the time, just disappeared. Bluebirds will not abandon a nest, so I know without a doubt something happened to them, so I was really worried this year if I was going to have bluebirds, you know, knowing that I don't have the best habitat for that. So I was extremely excited. Um, and I will say this is the earliest I've ever had bluebirds build a nest, but these aren't the bluebirds I've had building a nest. So it's not unusual for people to have them building them this early. I know one of our team members here does have a pair building two that have already started lining Hers always seem to build early. Um, so don't give up, you know, even if, as you see in people, like the pictures and the babies hatching and all that, still don't give up because we've got all the way through August for our bluebirds to nest. And now, Barb, if people have questions, they can email the, the store email that I'll be providing tomorrow in the follow-up email as well, the Wild yeah. W email, call either one of the stores. Um, we have a really active Facebook page. So check in on our Facebook page. Um, and we actually also have a Facebook group, Birds of Southern Maryland by WBU. Oh, okay. Um, and that one is really cool because that's your chance to share your pictures of what's going on in your yard. 
we're not always on there to see the questions or the things, but our customers do an amazing job of answering those questions and helping to educate people that are like, I'm new to birding and what the heck is that? So that's a wonderful resource. And it, I, I'm going to tell you, if you've been on other birding groups where people can get a little bit snippy, you're not going to find this on this group. It's all people here in Southern Maryland. So it's Birds of Southern Maryland by WBU. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. Okay. Just search for that and you will find it. I'll try to remember on both of our Facebook pages to put a link to that as well. Okay. And I have one more question myself. Yeah. You talked about the live uh, mealworms. Where, how do you feed, where do you put those to feed to the birds? Do you right. put them in a feeder? Yeah, so you can use just any type of feeder. This is one that you can use. What you want is a smooth surface so those mealworms aren't able to crawl out. We have a lot of different dishes, uh, but basically just something smooth. They come in a bag like this. There is just uh, brown paper in there that they use to tunnel into, to hide. Couple cool things. Let me stick this back up before I drop something. So with my bluebirds, what I do is when I go out, I'll just yell, Mama Blue, Papa Blue. Now that was my old bluebirds. They knew to come, so I have to retrain these ones. Uh, but as soon as they heard that, they would know I was bringing the live mealworms. And you would hear them immediately tweeting up there in the tree. The second I put those mealworms in, they were gone. Wow. You can whistle. You basically train them to whistle. We have a chow bell that you can ring. To, but you're going to do the same thing every time. You try to do it around the same time every day. They would get till, if I was late coming out there, they would be up in the window feeder just looking like, uh, it's time now. So, so their birds are just amazing. Where do you keep those? Do you refrigerate them? or You okay. will refrigerate them, yes. So uh, what we recommend is just top here, just some kind of, we use like, you know, like one of these shoebox plastics, but just a small plastic container because some of the droppings will come out there and you don't want to drip them through the fridge, okay. uh, but just some kind of little plastic bag. And then you uh, just so take a spoon and put them on the feeder just once a day. Or yeah, but you'll only use that spoon for a short time. Before long, it doesn't even face you and you just keep them up out of there. Okay. That's interesting. I've never, I never had asked you about that. So yeah, yeah. Mealworms are a great way to create a really cool relationship. Um, you know, where we have people that will go out, put them in their hands and their birds will come and eat from them. Um, I see Judy there and Judy is famous for hand feeding her birds. Uh, just they get really comfortable with you. That's amazing. I know you always said that, but I didn't realize it was the meal, the live mealworms that you were feeding those bluebirds. So yeah. Yeah. Uh oh, I think we have another couple questions, and then we've got to let you go because this you could probably talk to us all night. Oh, uh, I could. Yeah, I'm a bird nerd. Oh, let's see. I have squirrels sometimes on my bird feeders. Could that be why I don't have any bird nests? Uh, the question would be is if the birds are, the squirrels are getting up to the houses, then yeah, that could be a problem. We have a baffled pole system that if you have a spot where you can put your bird feeding pole and give us 10 foot clearance all the way around it, no trees, no sheds, deck rails, things like that, we can squirrel proof those feeders. If birds are having to compete with squirrels for food, they will head over to that neighbor's house who has their poles baffled and they know there's not that competition. So we can baffle them. We can also use, well, gosh, that feeder I showed you with the cylinder logs, those come in hot pepper that squirrels aren't a fan of. Birds have different taste receptors, does not phase those. So that's a way. I would try to find a way to keep those squirrels off the feeders and limit it just to the birds, whether it's using hot pepper foods, a pole system with a baffle, or we even have squirrel proof feeders that truly are squirrel proof. Okay. And then this is the last one and I promise we're gonna let you go. What is the difference between the black capped chickadee and the Carolina chickadee? Uh, 
very little. Um, unless you live in an area where you have both, you're not going to notice the difference. There's a little bit of size difference, a little bit of difference in the bib shape. But if I were to have one show up here at my feeders, I wouldn't see the difference. I mean, it, you really have to have a good eye and have spent some time seeing both species to be able to differentiate them. If we live okay. up in Western Maryland and that, we would learn. But So in, in our area, we basically just have the Carolina chicken. Yeah, it would be very rare, not unheard of, but very rare to see a black cap chickadee around this area. Okay. And with that, I think we're going to let you go because it's almost eight o'clock and I know you want to leave that store. <laughs> but we're going to put all of this information in the follow-up email tomorrow. We would love for you all to sign up for the April 6th uh, program about the hummingbirds. And with that, Barb, I'm going to let you go <laughs> and have some dinner. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, everyone, for signing on this evening, and I hope I see you again next month. Bye-bye. Bye, Barb. Take bye -bye. care. Bye.